Wow, I can barely keep up with all the bike previews this week. It's just getting crazy. What's the newest one? Well, the 2022 KLR 650 from Kawasaki, but is it really new? Welcome to Sixes Overdrive, everybody. My name is Kent, and if you haven't been here before, this channel is primarily about motorcycles, barbecues, and of course, music. Today, we're gonna to be talking about motorcycles, the KLR650. Uh, just so you know, I don't get paid to make these reviews, so they're honest, they're from my heart, and they're from my perspective as being an actual KLR owner. So, if you like that idea, and you wanna subscribe, just hit the button down below and hit the bell so that you're notified about future videos that come out on this channel. And if you'd like to leave a comment, that's awesome. I really love interacting with everybody and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. So first off, let's talk about my owning a KLR650. I had a 2008 KLR650 that uh, I had for, I'd say about 40,000 kilometers and two, two and a half years. I traded it in on my Tiger 800 XC and uh, yeah, so I have a fairly intimate knowledge about what the KLR650 was all about. I also, after driving the Tiger 800 XC and finding out that every time I crashed it, it was gonna cost me $500, I decided to trade in on a Suzuki DR650. That just happens to be the KLR650's direct competitor. So I can direct you a little bit on which one you should get between those two as well because I've owned them both and I put miles on. I think my DR650, uh, let's say probably 30,000 kilometers over three years. I didn't ride that one as much as I rode the KLR650. So why am I giving you this history? Well, I just wanted you to know that the new KLR is really not that far off of the old KLR. So it might be nice to actually have some experience here. In this particular example, I'm feeling like a little bit of an expert. The KLR was one of Kawasaki's most popular selling bikes for over 20 years, and they canned it in 2018. And so there's a lot of people expecting a lot of new stuff. They thought they were gonna come out of the doors just swinging, and uh, you know, not so much, not so much. So although there's not that much to talk about, there are some pretty significant upgrades and updates. Let's talk about those. The biggest update, and this one is of vital importance, is fuel injection. This bike was driven all over the place by many, many different people from sea level up to 10,000 feet, climbing mountain ranges, doing whatever. This bike was Mr. Versatility. Having a carburetor meant that you were getting really lean as you went up in altitude and a lot of adjustments. And then cold weather starting, cold weather gas mileage, all these kinds of things were a pain in the butt with the old carbureted system. Fuel injection should be fabulous for that. There might be some uh, class of guys, these KLR guys are a little bit hardcore in wanting to maintain their own bikes and everything. And some of those guys will be a little bit more upset about the fuel injection because fuel injection, let's face it, is if something does go wrong, it's a lot harder to do something than the old carburetors that you could get at just about any store. And not such a big upgrade is the one CC to 652 CCs. What? Why are they even bringing this up in the literature? I have no idea, one cc. And we've also got some crisper, cleaner, more edgy bodywork for 2022. Uh, tell me what you think down below. It's, a, it's not really a reinventing the wheel type design. It's more of an evolution of where the bike should go. I think it looks a little more handsome than the old one did. Tell me your thoughts down below. They've also added a new generator that generates more power. There's 80 watts of available power for accessories. Now, part of the reason why you've got that extra capacity is because they've went to LED lights, which take up a lot more energy. But still, that gives you room for GPSs and other devices that you wanna do like uh, hand warmers and things like that. A new sealed battery. Sealed batteries are great for if you're doing off-road and dumping your bike in water a new lighter, more efficient exhaust, a new starter and coil, supposed to be stronger and better, a new LCD dash. Let's face it, the only thing that this LCD dash is newer than is the Kawasaki's old dash or the DR650s that were just little analog units before. 
Man, I have a 2006 Kawasaki Brute Force 650 quad and the dash looks like it was stolen off of that thing. So they didn't put any new technology in, but it's still an upgrade. But the old one didn't tell you the time of day or anything. Like it was bare bones. Now that you have the extra wattage, you actually have a bar that goes above the, uh, above that dash. Now that's something, that's actually one of the coolest things about this bike. It's not saying for very much about how they updated it, but I would like to see that on a few more bikes, even on my Tracer or something, where you have a spot above the gauges to put your uh, GPS and all that kind of stuff on there. That is a really cool idea, actually. I'm really on board with that. We now have USB and DC power outlets. That's pretty cool. The brakes, at least the front brake I hear, is 20 millimeters larger. So that should be an improvement of braking. It wasn't really lacking on a bike like this. You don't need a whole lot in brakes on a bike like this, especially if you're doing fire roads, anything gravel or dirt. One thing about the brakes though is they have a, for about 300 US dollars, you can now get ABS, which is pretty good, I think, for a KLR 650, because most of the people that buy these drive them on the road a lot and uh, ABS is always beneficial. It allows you to do panic stops without putting the bike down or washing out your front wheel very well. I think this is a welcome addition, 300 US, pretty good thing to put on your bike. I'm not sure if it's switchable or not. So some of you might be a little bit upset about that. If it's not, I can't tell you right now. It doesn't appear to have any switch off mode to it. It is a Bosch system. It's supposed to engage uh, more on the, uh, so it'll take a while to engage is what I'm trying to tell you, if that makes any sense. It's not a very hypersensitive ABS system. It's just meant for emergencies. We actually have some easy to use suspension upgrades in the rear for, uh, for adding a passenger or adding luggage or something like that. Other than that, the suspension is supposed to be slightly improved. We won't know about that until we ride it. In Canada, there's a few different options available now. You have the base model without ABS, then you can add ABS. I'm going to be putting the website here where it's got the different options on it so that I don't screw up the prices for you. This is all in Canadian dollars. So in Canada, they're showing uh, an adventure model and that's going to have the bags on the front, uh, fog lights and everything. That sucker is going to run up close to $10,000. In other places, they're going to have one with top boxes and some of the accessories that you can plug into like your USB and your DC power. And as far as I can tell, with the optional packages, you get ABS automatically, but that could change. They just have some basics on the website right now, and I'm not sure if you can order that with or without ABS. I'm thinking it'll be included once you go up from the basic model. Your next step up will be the uh, ABS model, and then you can get a top case model in some places, and then you can get the adventure model in uh, places, which is pretty neat because you get a fully kitted out adventure model for less than $10,000 Canadian. Where can you get that? And then finally, but not insignificantly, they've actually increased the length of this bike, which if it's for 90% of the riders that are driving fire roads and uh, pavement, that's pretty good. That should make for more stability through corners. Um, through more general stability all the way around. But when you get to off-road, this bike was never quick turning off-road and that's kind of what you need for some tight trails or hill climbing and stuff like that. And extending the wheelbase, in my opinion, will hurt it a little bit more on the dirt. But you can always go to a DR650 if you don't like the dirt capabilities of the KLR. That was always the choice. Now let's talk about what hasn't changed about this bike. Number one is the engine. Except for the fuel injection, this thing is the same old dog that barely had 40 horsepower running for it. That's what people claimed, but nobody could ever prove it on a dyno. So I think we're right back at that. The engine's gonna feel almost identical. I don't see any changes here that will have made any difference to the engine. And this engine, you're lucky to get 130 kilometers an hour on a freeway out of it, because if you did more than that, for a long period of time, you're almost putting as much oil into the bike as gas. At least that was the case with my KLR 650. Until I put a new piston kit in it, it was burning oil like crazy. Another thing that hasn't changed is the weight. It's still categorized as a bush pig. It is the heaviest bike in his class, which nicely lends to a nice road ride actually. 
but not good for off-road. The seat looks unchanged, and to be polite, it's uncomfortable. More like a pommel horse. If you want to put long miles on this, you better be switching out to a seat concepts or a Corbin or something like that, because this seat is horrible. And now where the bike sits as far as the competition, I'd say you've got the DR650, which was always the KLR's primary competition. And now you've got the new Royal Enfield Himalayan, which is probably down a little bit more on power even to the KLR. The KLR is gonna be the highest priced out of them. And my guess is it should be the best road handling bike, not the best off-road. I haven't ridden the Himalayan. I have owned the DR650. And there are vast differences between the DR650 and the KLR650. The DR650 is primarily more focused on the dirt and you have to mod it for the highway. The KLR650 is the other way. It's a little bit tough to drive in the dirt, but a fabulous street bike, if not a little underpowered and a little heavy. So remember I said earlier that there's some people that really thought that KLR was going to come out and do something special? those people are gonna be really disappointed because there's not much extra in this except for to keep an old KLR owner and maybe put them into a new KLR and get some of the nicer things. This is leaps better than the old KLRs. I think most of these people were expecting a Tenere 700 killer and this bike is not that. It will not match up on or, on or off-road. It doesn't have the horsepower. It doesn't have the handling. It doesn't have the componentry. Uh, you're talking twin to single. It's a totally different bike. This is simply an updated KLR650. And some people, I understand that you're upset because you thought the KLR was gonna go away and come back with a new super bike, and that clearly didn't happen. But you see, those same people don't understand something. To get into a Tenere 700, you're looking at thousands of dollars more, like somewhere around three to $4,000 more for a Yamaha Tenere 700. And this KLR is the type of bike that a person just starts riding and they wanna go out with their buddies and it can go anywhere and do anything. And it only costs them, well, what, for a basic model is gonna be under $8,000. It's affordable, it's easy to work on yourself. The bike, has got a strong, strong list of followers. Like there's people all over that swear by this bike. People that have owned them for hundreds of thousands of kilometers. And that's who they're selling to. They know their market. It's gonna be one of their best sellers again, just because there's hardly anything that you can buy that will do as much as the KLR will. It doesn't do anything really great, but it does everything fairly well. So in my opinion, this bike has got a perfect target audience and it's just gonna be sold back to those guys again. It is a serious upgrade over the 2018 and prior models. Anybody who has those is probably either gonna to wanna to upgrade into something like a Tenere 700, because now they have the money, now they're ready for the extra power and the extra handling. But I think that most of the people who are gonna buy this 2022 KLR650 with its new, um, new upgrades are gonna be first time buyers, um, People wanting to go on an adventure on the cheap, that's who's going to get it. And it is leaps and bounds over the other one, just in these little features. They, they don't seem like much, but they make a difference when you're riding the same bike and you add those features. And you really aren't paying that much more than what the old KLR was. And again, on that price, you can get the DR650, but you'll have to mod it a little bit to get it to the roadworthiness of the KLR and the Himalayan. You can put some cases on and stuff like that, but that'll be the most affordable out of all of them. So the KLR is at the high end, but it's still not very high. It's starting out under $8,000. Well, everybody, that's about all I have to say. Please remember to share, like, comment, and subscribe, and leave a comment down below. This is Sixes Overdrive, and I'm out of here. Bye-bye. <laughs>